Last month in November, the winter wind patterns finally arrived to the Tokyo area, and clear skies entered our forecast. In the past, I used to wait for a new moon to plan overnight trips to darker skies, but recently I have started to settle for moon free half nights as another option. On Friday, November 22nd, the 60% waning gibbous moon would not rise until 10:41 p.m. And with sunset at 4:36 p.m., I figured there'd be several good hours of imaging time in between. The only issue would be what time is the last train back to Yokohama? Since I wanted to return that night from a dark site, then it logically had to be a trip to Izu where I have easy access to the bullet train, the Japanese Shinkansen. So in the early afternoon, I bought a round trip Shinkansen ticket to Atami because my final destination was going to be only two stops south at Izutaga Station. I had never visited this small coastal town before, but on the map, it looked to be in potentially Bordel Class 4 territory, and it had a very interesting looking pier extending well out into the ocean. That, I thought, just might be an excellent imaging site. It was only a kilometer walk downhill to the beach from the JR station. The Izu Line train and the station were rather quaint. I arrived in the early afternoon so I could check out the area and have plenty of time to set up before dusk. The seaside had a beautiful children's playground area and the two ocean piers were obviously built to protect the nice sandy beach, which I suspect must be pretty popular in the summertime. Oh, and one other super important point, no lighthouses. The imaging equipment I brought along was my Move Shoot Move Nomad Star Tracker and all the accessories I needed, including some new equipment that I will introduce soon. The photo on the left shows the equipment I needed to pack and on the right, it is all protected in padded packaging or hard shell cases. It was very minimal and it all fit into one big backpack. I got everything down to only 17 kilograms, which included a few kilograms of winter clothing too. Since my plan was to image only for about three hours and return home that same night, I didn't feel like dragging along any excessive weight. Besides, I was still trying to perfect my Star Tracker equipment selection for future lightweight imaging adventures. This trip was kind of like a reconnaissance excursion to explore the location and try out some new equipment. The pier turned out to be excellent. It was wide and stable and had no artificial lighting. At the tip of the pier, I was more than 100 meters away from any park or town lights. Looking in this direction, that pointed small mountain peak was due north and in the direction of Atami. At night, there was a bit of a light dome over this area of the sky. I set up my rig dead center in the middle of the pier with plenty of time before sunset. The equipment was nearly identical to that described in my prior video, episode 43, with one exception. This night, I was excited to use my new Arca Swiss geared head clamp from Vertec Photo. Model GHV5 is something I learned about from a posting on the Move Shoot Move user group Facebook page. I bought it off Amazon.com and had it shipped directly to Japan. The size and weight and design of this clamp looked like a good match for use with my Ascar FMA 135 astrograph lens. I am pretty good at manually locating deep sky objects in the sky, but my biggest issue with this 135mm focal length rig is framing of the target. In wide field Milky Way photography, a ball head mount works fine with my Canon camera. But for this Ascar telescope lens, a ball head mount is very frustrating since subtle movements are required. Here is the Vertec photo unit on my assembled OTA. Notice the smooth operation of this instrument. Its incremental gear-driven movements 
are probably the perfect gear ratio for panning across the night sky in astrophotography applications, at least at this focal length. But for your information, there is no clutch release on these gears. You need to wind it to every position. Also, although there is a latch for each gear direction, it does not lock down the position, but rather adds a little resistance for more fine-tuned movements. However, I found that once in position, there is no slippage of the gears whatsoever. It is completely stable. Indeed, this Vertex Photo geared head unit is an ideal match to my Nomad Star Tracker and Ascar Telescope unit. It literally has reduced the time I have wasted in target identification and especially image framing by 70% or more. It was worth every penny. So the sun went down, it was a little cloudy, but I was able to get a good polar alignment through the clouds. And then over in the east I found my target, and uh, then more clouds rolled in and the wind kicked up. So this is a little unexpected. I'm going to wait it out, see what happens. Hopefully I can get some imaging in tonight. Well, I tried. Although the clouds cleared, the wind was quite severe, as you can hear in these videos. That was unforecasted, and probably worse because I was exposed on the ocean pier. As you might expect, this tiny little imaging rig is very susceptible to wind. Even when I cut exposure times down to just 15 seconds, I still got star trailing in over 70% of the images that I took that evening. I won't even show you my embarrassing image of the Pleiades. Although disappointing, this night really was a reconnaissance trip. I knew it was risky, but I felt the location was worth the effort. It was still an enjoyable trip for me, and I wanted to come back, even though I realized that the sky here was probably not completely Bortel Class 4. The east and south were quite dark, but the other directions were a bit more bright. So I packed up my equipment, and from the pier at Nagahama Seaside Park, I climbed back up the steep hill, about 55 meters in elevation, to the JR train station, which was about a kilometer away. I got on the next train back to Atami and arrived a bit early. The next and last Shinkansen to Yokohama wasn't for at least 30 minutes, so I exited the station. Out front, was this display of the first commercial passenger train engine that ran in this area, dating from the early 1900s. Compared to this, I'd say the technology has come a long way The ride back on the last bullet train to Yokohama was quiet, and I needed to fight sleep or I might just miss my stop. Overall, the entire trip from Izutaga Station to my home station was only a bit longer than one hour, including transfer times. Remarkably fast. I definitely wanted to try again as soon as possible. And so I did, only three days later. The weather on the night of Monday, November 25th was nearly perfect for astrophotography. A little colder, but looking ideal. On this particular night, I arrived at the pier around sunset and quickly set up my rig. But learning from my experience three days earlier, this time I brought along a blue tarp and utilized the fencing to erect a wind barrier for my imaging rig. It probably was not necessary since there was only a gentle five mile per hour breeze from the north but it was a precaution. I used the uninhabited mountain to the north to align my laser pointer with the OTA and then got busy with polar alignment as the night settled in. Here was the imaging plan that I executed that evening. I figured that I could get two targets imaged before I had to rush back to the station to make the last train. My first target was to be the Veil Nebula, which was high in the sky, having just crossed the meridian to the west. And my second target was to be the Pleiades star cluster. 
On this night, I was using my newish ASI 585MC Color Planetary Camera to do the imaging. This is an excellent camera. Its full well depth is quite deep for a planetary camera, and it has slightly smaller pixels than my ASI 533MC Pro. With the IMX 585 sensor size, I could get a nice framing of the full Veil Nebula region. This image is a 60 second exposure using the Optolong L Extreme filter. I also included part of the image zoomed in to show you the star shapes. At 60 seconds, the stars looked to be quite round. There was no noticeable trailing indicating a good polar alignment and an excellent performance of the Nomad Star Tracker. But regardless, I like to use 30 seconds for my exposure times when imaging with this setup. The number of frames is a bit high, but manageable. Anything less than 30 seconds would be too many subframes, and longer exposure times increases the risk of dropping too many frames due to tracking artifacts. So I prefer 30 seconds with this Nomad Tracker rig. Even though there appeared to be super excellent tracking and no star trailing at 30 or 60 second exposure times, this was not exactly true. I imaged the Veil Nebula at around 6 p.m. until nearly 7.30 p.m. Here are two subframes of the field of view taken at 1756 on the left and 1924 on the right. Notice, during this time, between these two photos taken nearly 90 minutes apart, there is a slight drift of the image going upwards. The actual field of view defined by the sensor and the imaging rig assembly was not altered, so this drift is likely from a slight misalignment with the true celestial north pole. Of course, this is expected. Actually getting a perfect polar alignment with an imaging rig this small and portable is completely impossible. I also knew that this kind of drift is something that can result in walking noise in the final stacked and processed image. I have seen it before, but we will address that later. Next, I turned my laser and pointed it toward the east at the Pleiades star cluster on the other side of the sky. In my experience, jostling the rig around, shifting the weight, and framing another target using a lightweight and portable rig like this always has some effect on the polar alignment. So I polar aligned again once I had the rig repositioned. That is the reason why I never really remove all of the polar alignment accessories during my imaging. I find that I may want to realign at some time during the night. However, it is important to remove the fluorescent illuminator because it extends outward a bit far and can jam into other equipment during rotation. Uh, trust me on this, unfortunately, I know. But the scope and laser are in no danger of any jamming with camera or other gear. Here is a single frame 30 second exposure taken at 8 p.m. The polar alignment looked good, and I took 140 exposures with a UV IR cut filter. The total imaging time ended up being a little over one hour with one of the last images taken at 9.10 p.m. Similar to before, this is a comparison of an early sub-exposure to a late frame, taken over one hour apart. The blue arrows again show a drift of the image this time in a downward direction because we are now east of the meridian. This drift actually appeared to be a little bit more than I observed with the Veil Nebula. Okay, shown here are the processing software and workflow that I used to generate the final processed image. Serial for stacking, Graxpert for removal of light gradients and color balancing, GIMP for processing, Starnet++ for star removal, and Topaz Denoise and iPhoto for final touch-ups. First, I'll show you the Veil Nebula. On this target, I took 160 usable frames, and with the help of Starnet++, I was able to pull out a nice image with only 80 minutes of total exposure time. The field of view of this OTA setup is about 4.7 degrees by 2.7 degrees of sky with a resolution of 4.43 arc seconds per pixel. I am pretty pleased with the image. 
although it is not one of my best of this target. It certainly has some nice color, excellent framing, and the star shapes look pinpoint and round. Undersampled, but round. But I mentioned earlier about the drift in the image and the possibility of walking noise. If you look close here, you can see some streakiness going on from the bottom left to the upper right. Look closely in the dark background areas. Overall, however, it is a very respectable image. Now, let's have a look at the Pleiades star cluster image. I can sing the same praises about this image as well. The framing and the color are excellent. I especially like the star color that came through with red or yellow stars sprinkled throughout the image. Star shapes look pretty good, but perhaps not perfect on very close inspection under high zoom, but it is hardly noticeable. And by the way, I did not use StarNet on this image to remove the stars. It introduced too many artifacts. Interestingly though, I don't see any walking noise even though this target also suffered from the same image drift phenomena. It is probably just less noticeable here due to the shape and homogeneous color of this particular deep sky object. I am also a bit surprised to see some structure, fine detail in the nebula regions between the stars. And given the 30 millimeter aperture of the scope, which is small and hence has limited resolution. Overall, again, it is a very respectable image. In summary, I think that I have found my ideal Star Tracker imaging rig configuration, and that now includes this Vertex Photo geared head mount. It is so much easier to use this Arca Swiss geared mount when trying to frame fairly small deep sky objects compared to using a ball head style mount and clamp. By the way, to fully utilize the Vertex Photo unit, you definitely need to have something like the Allen Wallace V-mount to be able to image a target near to the zenith. If you attach it directly to the Nomad Tracker, like shown here on the right, it will start on a negative incline and not be able to reach high in the sky deep sky objects. So keep that in mind. Also, Recently I realized that Move Shoot Move has a geared head Arca Swiss clamp in their catalog too. It has a very slightly higher payload capacity, but weighs more than twice as much, nearly a kilogram. I cannot be sure, but the unit looks identical to the Benro GD3WH product, so it is probably an OEM item. From my experience with the Vertec Photo GH V5 unit, I am highly satisfied with my choice, but I encourage you to take a look at the Move Shoot Move geared head unit and decide for yourself. It has a few more features, and they are both about the same price. Finally, I think what you see here is the final evolution of my lightweight Star Tracker system. I don't foresee myself tinkering anymore with the accessories. This system is a fully integrated mini powerhouse for lightweight precision deep sky imaging. I look forward to using it a lot in the future because my passion is to image the night skies in Japan. I am JP Astro Guy. My name is Paul Cheesejaw and thank you for watching Astrophotography Japan.